Kia ora everybody and welcome back to Theology where we drink tea and talk theology. We are drinking lychee tea and continuing our discussion on the covenants. Last week we talked about Adam and Eden and the Adamic and Edenic covenants that could have been formed there. And this week we're talking about the next covenant that occurs which occurs in Genesis 9 which is the Noahic covenant. Now if you did watch last week's video we discussed how Adam and the covenants in that beginning first couple of chapters in the Bible are debated as to whether or not they're actually covenants. This Noah, the Noahic covenant, is the first uh, time that it is fully agreed upon that it is definitely a covenant because it is also the first time that the word covenant appears in the Bible. I'm pretty sure it's the first time it appears at all in the Bible. If it isn't, it's the first time it's used between God and people. This covenant is detailed in Genesis 9, which occurs just after the flood. And the first time the word covenant appears in the Bible is Genesis 6, uh, 6.18, in fact, which it says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives, with you. So one of the important things to note about the covenant is that it goes for all of humanity. This covenant that God is establishing with Noah that he details and talks a lot about in Genesis 6 and is formally established, established in Genesis 9 goes for everybody. This is an all of humanity covenant. Now this covenant hasn't been made yet in Genesis 6 but it is put out there as a this is what I'm asking you to do when that has been completed this covenant can be formed so it's uh, on the condition that Noah does as he was asked. God says that he will make the covenant and details what will be included in the rest of the passage. The covenant, covenant is then confirmed and uh, detailed again in Genesis 9, 1 to 17. The specific parts of the covenant are very similar to the instruction or covenant that God gives Adam, though there are some amendments and additions. And there's these similarities in the use of this repeated language that was used in Genesis 1 and 2 is being repeated again here in Genesis 6 and 9 because we're meant to start to see Noah as potentially being a new Adam and going, oh, maybe this will be when the redemption happens. Maybe Noah will be able to step up to par. Spoiler alert, he's not, but that's in the rest of Noah's story. There, so the similarity, and the biggest similarity is the be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And God had given the, him the green animals to eat. Now, this is an amendment or an addition. He is giving him the animals as food as well. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And the third one is don't shed blood, specifically human blood. So when we look at the suzerain type of covenant, which we have talked about, when we look at the suzerain vassal type of covenant, which this would have to be, so with God being the unequal part, with, because God and Noah are an unequal parties, how would this fit into that framework and the specifics required for it to meet that? So first off, it is initiated by God that he will never destroy life on earth again through a flood. This is his obligation for the vassal. He gives blessings, this being like the green plants and animals for food. God is bound unconditionally to the covenant that he's made with the people. He will not destroy all life on earth through a flood again. That is the promise that he has made. And it is showing that this is passed down from generation to generation because this is a covenant that still stands today. This covenant was not given an end point, really. It was given as one, or its end point might, will probably be in new heavens and new earth. But even then, I'm not. It is still standing today. We can break the covenant, but the blessings and the truth of the covenant still stand for today. However, there are consequences for breaking that covenant. Um, 
that with the covenant, whoever sheds the blood of people, their blood will be shed. This could be argued to be a curse, but the language one might expect from that isn't here. This is a binding the covenant through a consequence of them breaking it. This is a binding of the covenant through the consequence of them breaking it, this aspect of the covenant. This does have to be laid out specifically due to the presence of sin. Before this passage, we see how much killing and death goes on between like Genesis 4 to Genesis uh, Genesis 4, 5 and 6. A lot of it really details the uh, killing and destruction that goes on with people. All the people that Cain is held up as someone to be like and to be better than even though he was the person that killed his brother. This is something that is seen as necessary by the preceding stories. The murder and destruction of God's creation by people and the destruction of the people he created in particular is what leads God to cause the flood. It is because of sin that this statement is required. When he destroys the un unrepentant here through a flood, he doesn't surrender his purpose for creating people. That this covenant does get broken, that we see the fallenness and sin still in Noah, even though he was uh, walked with God, he wasn't perfect. And we see that afterwards when he plants a vineyard and gets drunk and ends up revealing himself to his son, one of his sons. That's detailed more in the next chapter of Genesis. So that immediately makes us go, oh, we had this hope that Noah would be different, but he wasn't. He wasn't different to Adam. He still fell, because the same language is used for us with, with God walking with Adam in the garden, and it talks about Noah walking with God. We go, maybe, maybe, maybe. But the whole point of the story is for us to continuously be disappointed and to constantly be on the lookout and have the ear out for the idea of a new Adam. And these new Adams are often uh, established and shown to us through the covenants in the Bible. And Noah is the first time that we see that, that we see we have that experience of the new Adam. And one of the really interesting things here is that God had a purpose for creating the creation. He wanted people to steward the earth. He wanted the earth to be filled with the life, with the trees and the birds and the animals and everything. It is every ounce of everything on this earth has been shaped and changed by the fact that there is life on it. If we were to take any of our dirt and put it on any other planet, something would die or there would be life on that planet. Because ev even our dirt, even our soil has life in it. So his purpose is still there. His purpose is affirmed and will be upheld through the creation of the covenant. Be fruitful and multiply. People are still sinful, that innate brokenness is still there, but in the flood God doesn't surrender his original purpose for creating, even when he is destroying the unrepentant. God's grace is still and always has been there. This is why Noah was chosen, not due to sinlessness. Noah was not a perfect man. It is due to God's grace. And I think one of the most interesting things about this story that comes up in quite a few deep dives I've heard about uh, Noah's flood is the parallels with the creation story. This story follows a decreation and recreation pattern. This means that there is an idea of a destruction that was there, so um, of people and the anim animals. We almost theoretically end up going back to the image of the spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis 1 because the world is the waters now. Then by God ending the flood, he it is a recreation again. By keeping the remnant of animals and Noah's family, there is the ability for that recreation event to start occurring. However, this new creation or recreation is still in the brokenness. It hasn't been fully made new. It was just a wiping of the slate and a restarting. The sin has not been atoned for. That separation is still there. This recreation is not the beginning of the paradise that we see in Genesis 
one that we see in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, the nature of the covenant must change. While the echoes of Adam are still there, um, we've already talked about the way things have changed, one being the threat of animals, so they're given the ability to eat the animals. There is also the threat of each other, of people killing each other, which God also covers. The third we haven't really talked about is God. If God could do this once, he can do it again. What happens next time he has to pour his wrath out against humanity? This isn't everything being made new and whole. That brokenness is still there. People are still going to make mistakes. So what's going to happen next? This is part of the reason why God, why God makes a covenant Noah, with Noah in such a way where the true upholding part of it is on God. He is the one who is not to pour his wrath out and pour that out on humanity in that way for the brokenness that they continuously cause and harm that they cause other people because that is going against his promise. That is going against the creation purpose for us. God will not do it again. He cannot break his word. He cannot break his promise. He offers himself as protection against all those things and he offers himself as protection against himself. He chose and constantly chooses not to destroy everything because of the brokenness in the world. Because he sees the good there and he sees the good he's created in us. He promises and he will never surrender the purpose of his creation in response to sin. He didn't do it then and he'll never do it. The plan is and always has been there right from when Adam sinned or probably even before that, God knew. Um, the plan has always been there to redeem it. To redeem it so creation can fulfill its truly God-given purpose. There are so many interesting things with Noah's story and so many things that we haven't been able to cover. It's really when we start to see the emergence of themes in Genesis 6 to 9 because they were ideas brought up in Genesis 1 to 3. If you're interested in that, I really encourage you to look deeper. The Bible Project has some amazing podcasts on Genesis that they've just put out. I encourage you to go deeper because there is so much in this story that adds more and more depth the more you understand it and the more you look to it. And it's where we start to see a lot of these ideas arise. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I'd love to hear any thoughts you have or anything you find really interesting in particular about the... Uh, covenant with Noah and Noah's story generally. I'll see you all next week. Bye!